Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today, we're talking remotely with Dr. Ira Kirschenbaum. Dr. Kirschenbaum is the chairman of orthopedic surgery at Bronx Lebanon Hospital in Bronx, New York. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Kirschenbaum. Thank you, Dr. Seacrest. Dr. Kirschenbaum, what I thought we would talk about today is, a, is, is getting to be a very common operation, and that's total hip replacement. And I think that, that a lot of people now consider this as a pretty routine operation, at least the first total hip replacement that a patient has. Uh, and we should distinguish that from what we would consider a revision total hip replacement, where you may have had a total hip replacement and, uh, earlier, and maybe it has served you well for several years and, and now is in need of, of revision or changing because you've worn it out. But what we're going to talk about today is the primary total hip replacement, and that is a patient who comes into the office with a worn out hip for whatever reason and is having enough hip pain that they've decided to discuss with their surgeon having an artificial hip replacement. So first, let's start out talking a little bit about what type of patients are these? What type of patients do you see in your practice that come in and start that discussion about having an artificial hip replacement? Sure. Well, first, let me say that uh, hip replacement or primary hip replacement is very possibly the most successful operation in the history of all surgery. When looking at study after study, patients can expect 97 to 99 percent patient satisfaction. You don't get that from Apple. You don't get that from Nordstrom's. You may get that from White Castle hamburgers in the Bronx, but you don't really get that from a number of places. So it has been an operation that originated in the early 1960s that has reached the level of perfection that is remarkable. The average patient that has the need for a hip replacement usually comes from one of four types of problems. The first is an osteoarthritis of the hip, which is a wear and tear, often considered age-related but sometimes considered genetic, as in a familial chance to get the osteoarthritis. The second form is called a rheumatoid arthritis, which is an inflammatory disease of the lining of bones and joints that could destroy the hip. Certainly, osteoarthritis is much more common. Two other very common forms of arthritis that I see in the hip in my population are avascular necrosis, which is a loss of blood supply to the hip that occurs from a variety of reasons. Sometimes people who have sickle cell trait, sometimes people have taken steroids, and I'm not talking about the athlete type steroids, I'm talking about the prednisone, prednisone type of steroids, which are very much in the line of people who have asthma or other type of inflammatory conditions. They can lose the blood supply to the hip joint it can die, and that would then require hip replacement. And the fourth most common form is what we would refer to as a post-traumatic. Someone who's had a fracture, maybe a hip fracture or a pelvic fracture, that then goes on to require a hip replacement. These are the four most common types of patients that come not only into my office, but into most orthopedic surgeons' offices. Now let's talk a little bit about the symptoms that might prompt a patient to come in and consider a hip replacement. What, what sort of symptoms do you feel that patients uh, have before they come and, and actually get down to the process of, of actually discussing this type of an operation? The symptoms related to hip replacement are in two categories. On one, you'd have pain, and the second category would be some type of loss of function. Let's talk about the pain for a second. First of all, the pain is usually very severe, maybe a seven or eight out of 10, often when they're walking, and worse when they're at rest. And many patients with hip arthritis complain of pain interfering with their sleep at night. The pain is, of course, the primary reason to go ahead with a hip replacement. The second is loss of function, and that includes walking, uh, activities of daily life, just as simple as getting in and out of a car, that's the most severe. We're not talking about someone who wants to reach the back corner of a tennis court. And we like to look in terms of the following types of criteria and function. How far can you walk? Usually hip replacement patients can't walk more than two to three blocks 
without having to make significant concessions to the pain. Do they use an assistive device? An assistive device is a cane, a walker, crutches. That's obviously a scooter. That would be an assistive device. How well can they walk up and down steps? Can they do steps easily with one step after the other? Or do they walk two feet on each step or one step at a time? Do they need to use the railing? Do patients need to get up from a sitting to standing position using their arms? Or can they do that without upper extremity support? These are some of the common questions I would ask somebody in an office related to their function. Related to pain, we often ask them to do what's called a visual analog pain score, where on a line from 0 to 100 or 0 to 10, they would draw a line where their pain is. And very frequently, it would be far to the right in the 7, 8, 9, or 10 out of 10 range. Now, when you see these patients at the, at the first visit as an orthopedic surgeon, and you, and you have this discussion about their pain and their symptoms, do you feel that once they've, they've seen you, they've come in because the pain is that great, are there conservative options that you provide the patient or at least discuss with the patient before they consider an operation? And if so, what are those, those options? Well, you bring up a good point. In general, I, I don't like to usually refer to them as conservative options because in some sense, a hip replacement can be a very conservative option since it is a mainstream operation. But I would certainly say non-operative options are very important. I think there are two that come to mind. First of all, the patient needs to understand that the reason to have a hip replacement is to decrease their pain and increase their function it doesn't matter what the x-rays look like. So if their pain is a three out of 10 and they're able to walk 20 blocks, it doesn't matter how bad the x-rays are frequently, you may not need a hip replacement. And sometimes something as simple as the use of a cane in the opposite hand is a powerful tool to decrease the forces across the opposite hip. So if you had left hip arthritis, use of a cane in your right hand could significantly decrease your pain and is a much better alternative than any type of surgery. Whether you would consider a hip replacement routine or major, the simple use of a cane to decrease your pain and avoid any kind of surgery is an excellent alternative. Additionally, the use of selective analgesics, something as simple as Tylenol, something as simple as Advil. If patients can take over-the-counter anti-inflammatory or Tylenol type medications and their pain goes away, they're very unlikely to require a hip replacement at that time. If you start having to get into higher narcotics and you're not able to get along without the use of an assistive device, I believe that that's a time to seriously consider hip replacement. People have also asked questions about the role of physical therapy in hip replacement. In my experience, there is a role only for training them how to walk with the assistive device and helping them how to transfer. Physical therapy does not have a very big role in decreasing the pain related to hip replacement. Let's move on to talk a little bit about the evaluation of, of hip pain in the office. When you as the orthopedic surgeon actually see the patient in the office, how do you go about making the diagnosis uh, of what's causing their hip pain? You know, it's interesting, once you've been doing this for a while, the best way to first of all make your initial impression is watching the patient walk down the hall and into the office. I can't tell you how many times I talk to emergency room doctors who see patients on gurneys and they tell me about their hip exam or their knee exam and they didn't see the patient walk. Watching the patient go from sitting to standing walking and then going back to sit is a tremendous value to the hip surgeon and seeing how well they walk, do they have a limp, do they have a limp that's related to muscle weakness, are they able to rotate the leg while they walk. That is a beginning of the hip exam, watching them walk into my office and sit down. The next part, of course, in the examination part, is looking at their leg lengths, seeing May, usually in a hip arthritis, one leg is shorter than the other due to the loss of the structure of the ball of the femur 
that would then collapse and cause some shortening of the hip joint. The next part I would look at is motion. How much can they flex? Usually in a hip replacement patient, the flexion is one of the last things to go in my experience, but rotation of the hip is one of the early things to go. The patient often lacks internal rotation, twisting the hip inward and outward, which is very painful because you need to do that every time you walk. So I look at those basic functions. Additionally, I'm also very interested in whether they're able to lay flat on the bed or do they have what's called a flexion contracture, where the hip sits in a flexed up position because of the scarring and the tightness of the hip. Also, I'm very aware of their pain while I'm examining them and rotating the hip. Because there are times when hip pain or pain perceived by the patient as a hip problem is actually coming from the spine. So if, I, if they claim they have groin or thigh pain and I rotate the hip and it rotates beautifully and there's no pain, I sometimes will do some studies to look higher up in the spine to see if they have a problem such as a lumbar disc or spinal stenosis, which can fool you, especially if the x-rays don't show much arthritis on top of this type of physical exam. And you're, you, you mentioned x-rays. What other type of tests do you feel are necessary to make this diagnosis? Do you, do you consider additional studies like an MRI scan or any other special radiographic studies necessary? In a majority of patients, an x-ray will make the diagnosis. There's no question about that. In osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, post-traumatic arthritis, an x-ray will make not only make the diagnosis, but is required to template or to plan your surgery off of that standard x-ray. But there is an indication for an MRI, and that's in cases of avascular necrosis. As I talked about, that was loss of blood supply to the ball of the hip. Avas necrosis has a number of stages in it, and the early stages can definitely be treated with non-joint replacement options. And one of the best ways to stage an avascular necrosis is to get an MRI. So if the patient has very mild arthritis on the x-ray or none but severe hip pain, I will often get an MRI and sometimes you see very advanced avascular necrosis with the MRI. I think one other thing we ought to bring up that you, you mentioned before and that's the patient who has arthritis of the hip, maybe not so great and a problem with their back. You know, the, the surgeon may be ordering an MRI scan of the spine uh, to try to rule that out. And some patients may be confused in, in terms of, you know, I came in here with hip pain, why are you ordering an MRI scan of my spine? So I think, I think we should, you know, point out to patients that if things like x-rays and MRI scans are ordered of the spine, it's because the surgeon is trying to make sure that the problem that they're dealing with is in fact coming from the hip. I agree with that. I think that whenever there's a question in your symptoms, whenever there's a mismatch between what you see on x-ray, your symptoms, and your physical exam, you have to look above and sometimes even below. Sometimes even a knee problem may cause people to walk a certain way and perceive the pain as somewhere else. But I have seen many cases of spinal stenosis and narrowing of the spine come to me as hip arthritis. And rarely, I've, also, I've often seen another type of problem where I've seen a general surgical problem called a femoral hernia. I've seen a femoral hernia mask itself as groin pain being sent to me to evaluate for hip arthritis. I don't see much on the arthritis, but when I examine the groin, I pick up a femoral hernia. Well, I think that's good, good information for people because that is one of those things that we don't commonly see or, or commonly think about in terms of, of hip pain. To, to complete this discussion about evaluation, do you think there's any role for any type of, of laboratory evaluation or any sort of special labs that you normally get when, when you're dealing with a patient with hip pain? In a primary hip arthritis, it's very rare that I would need any kind of laboratory. If they're a 
rheumatoid arthritic patient or I'm concerned they're rheumatoid arthritis, I may, if they haven't been sent by a rheumatologist, I may send a rheumatoid panel uh, such as an ANA test, latex fixation test. And the reason is the following. Rheumatoid arthritis pain is often very, very well treated with disease-modifying drugs that the rheumatologist give. So even though they may have some destruction of the hip joint, if I suspect a rheumatoid arthritis, I will evaluate them for rheumatoid disease to see if they can be treated medically before I would treat them surgically. But except for that, in a primary hip replacement, I don't need to order my standard labs that I would to prepare them for surgery, but certainly not to diagnose the hip problem. Well, once you've made your diagnosis and you've had this discussion with, with the patient and you and the patient have decided that, that a hip replacement is, is something that should be considered strongly and perhaps you're ready to schedule that, how do you prepare the patient for surgery? What sort of things are required of the patient in order to get ready for that day of surgery uh, as it's scheduled? Well, I think I like to look at it as a number of people have to get ready for that patient's surgery. The patient has to get ready, the surgeon has to get ready, the anesthesiologist has to get ready, the hospital has to get ready, the family has to get ready, and if they're going to an extended care facility, they have to get ready. So how do we start that? It first starts with education of the patient. They often see a video, they get an, a custom education packet that let them know every step of the way and we try very hard not to change that protocol from patient to patient so they know what to expect. In the medical preparation of the patient, in our type of joint replacement program, we actually have a perioperative hospitalist who specializes in preparing for the patient, who works with the community primary care physician to prepare the patient. So in a sense, we take over the immediate preoperative care in conjunction with the primary care physician, with our hospitalist who will also be, see the patient postoperatively, but will be in constant contact with the primary care physician. We have found that type of level of medical preparation gives a level of consistency and decreased errors in preparing the patient for surgery. Medically, we're looking at cardiac disease, People who have diabetes will often get nuclear stress tests, so we're not looking at what are called silent myocardial infarctions. We will often get pulmonary tests on certain types of patients. Every patient also is seen in a preoperative visit with an anesthesiologist and their team to evaluate their safety to undergo anesthesia. And that's a very important part of the preparation. Additionally, we need to prepare the operating room, and that is in the surgical planning range of how to prepare for the patient. But I think you may have some other questions about that. Well, we probably should talk a little bit about um, the day of surgery and, and when the patient shows up at the hospital, what should they expect in terms of, of the day of surgery? And how long should they plan on being in the hospital? And, and maybe give us sort of an idea of, of what the patient expects while they're in the hospital before they go home. Most, most patients who go to the hospital for a joint replacement surgery arrive on the same day they're going to have the surgery. I think when I originally trained 20 years ago, patients came in sometimes one or two days before surgery, but they don't do that now. Now they come the day of surgery, they won't eat or drink the night before. Certain medications they would take with a sip of water, others they'll be told by the anesthesiologist not to take. So it's careful you follow your medical doctor and your anesthesiologist's recommendation on which medications to take, but certainly there's no eating or drinking after midnight. Patients who come into the hospital, and I do between six and eight joint replacements on a given day, come in at staggered times during the day, but we like to get them in early to make sure that just in case there's any other tests we need to perform. When they get to the hospital, they'll be brought to a examination area, often called the ambulatory surgery or preoperative preparation area. They'll get a full intake by the anesthesiologist and the nurse. 
to confirm that everything is not only the correct operation, the correct side, but confirm their medications and their medical history. Once that's done, they're brought to the holding area where they're seen again by the surgeon and the anesthesiologist, and then they're brought into the operating room itself, which has already been prepared and ready for the joint replacement. And after surgery, I'm assuming that you send the patient to the recovery room and then back to the floor. Um, what happens after the surgery in terms of, of what the patient should expect, in terms of getting up, in terms of blood transfusions perhaps, and in terms of, of managing their pain in the post-operative period? What happens in the post-operative period while is somewhat patient-dependent has a certain routine. That night after surgery is usually a remarkable amount of pain, eight, nine out of 10. But every hospital I know has a pain management team that descends on the patient and offers the appropriate amount of pain medications. Oftentimes there's intramuscular injections with morphine and other opiate derivative drugs. Then we switch to some places have a pump, what's called a patient-controlled analgesia pump, where they hit a button and they get the pain inside. When you look at all this kind of stuff, you're going to see that there's tremendous care taken to help the patient to decrease that pain in the first few days because we like to get the patient up the first day after surgery. So they'll get up, they'll go out of bed, and they'll take a few steps. They'll continue physical therapy often twice a day and hopefully begin walking fairly well by the second or third day. Then it becomes hospital and community dependent. There are some hospitals that brag they get the patient home within two days, some within three days. I happen to feel it really doesn't matter at the third or fourth day. Certain patients with medical conditions do need to stay a little bit more to watch their blood count very carefully. Younger, healthier patients can be discharged a little earlier. So discharging some patients on the second day after surgery is not unheard of. Waiting till the fourth or fifth may be appropriate in certain situations. It depends on their blood count. Many patients donate their own blood prior to surgery, one or two units, and that's given back to them almost routinely. I recommend that on a regular basis. Although not every patient is healthy enough to donate their own blood. So we have other types of ways to handle that. We sometimes have drains coming out of the hip joint that take the blood and reinfuse it that night to give them some more of their own blood. But patients can need one or possibly two transfusions depend upon their general bleeding time and how much they usually bleed during a certain type of operation. Following that, a majority of patients actually go home from hip replacement and can go home because they're taught in the hospital to walk at least four steps, to walk 50 to 100 feet with some type of assistive device. And I believe that a majority of patients can go home. But it's not always practical for certain patients with very bad upper body strength and difficulty and lack of safety in transferring. The patient's safety is the utmost importance here. Well, when you go home after, after you've, you've finished your hospital stay, what, what should a patient expect in terms of physical therapy and in terms of rehab? Do you use physical therapists in that phase a, a lot or not? I always use physical therapy in the post-operative phase for two important things. Transfers of the patient safely and training them how to walk again. Hip replacement patients invariably get their motion back. So unlike knee replacement, where post-operative physical therapy is extraordinarily important, there are some very well-regarded hip replacement surgeons who don't order a lot of physical therapy post-operatively, and they can't be faulted for that. I find the role of physical therapists is in safe transfers, teaching them how to use the assistive devices, and teaching them how to walk again without a limp and doing what's called gait training and walking in that way. Later, months later, if they're weak, we can do some strengthening exercises. But in the early going, 
It's about what I've just talked about, as well as instructing the patient with what is classically called hip precautions. And that is the type of position you could safely put your hip in to prevent it from dislocating. Now we've changed over the years in a type of hip precautions we used to have. When Sir John Charnley of England first developed the hip replacement, his precautions were quite strict. They also didn't get the patient out of bed for quite a long time. But historically, it used to be don't bring the leg up to 90 degrees so the hip wouldn't flex to 90 degrees, don't cross your legs. Some of these have been loosened to some extent because we're using implants, replacements that have larger heads and much more difficult to dislocate. But in general, each surgeon has a guideline of how much flexion, how much internal rotation, and what types of positions, whether that's bending and bending down in a chair, they allow the patients. So your surgeon's specific, what's called arthroplasty precautions are developed based upon the specific surgical approach they use. So your surgeon's guidance is critical to follow in this. And, and what about weight bearing? Are you letting your patients get up and put as much weight as they can tolerate immediately on the hip? Or are you still having patients stay at a partial weight bearing uh, uh, situation? All my patients weight bear full weight bearing on the first day. I do ask them to use a cane, initially a walker of course, I asked them to use a cane for six weeks to help them get their walking pattern better, but I don't restrict any of their weight bearing. I don't keep them 50%, 75%. It's weight bearing is tolerated, and that has been a very, very good protocol for patient activity. And in terms of recovery, how long in your experience does it take a patient to get over a hip replacement to the point to where they can pretty much do whatever they want to within reason and pretty much consider this operation behind them? Well, I guess if they wanted to play poker in a grand uh, World Series of Poker in Vegas, they could probably do that in about four days. But if they want to do anything more functional, I tell my patients we have three phases of healing. The first phase of the first two weeks where you heal the wound, and while you're angry at your surgeon for giving you that pain, you're beginning to understand that your hip pain is gone. From two to six weeks is early function and motion because by the end of the six week, you're walking fairly well. I think you're 85% there as far as pain relief and function. And the last six weeks, I'd say three months is where you begin to forget you had the hip replacement. So I'd say three months is the beginning of forgetting to have your hip replacement. Now some people have remarkable results. I had one of my patients who I did both hips at the same time, drive to my office for six weeks, claimed he had no pain, walked without crutches. Very rare, I never saw a patient like that again. I have others who lag a little bit behind based on how devitalized they were before surgery. So I look at it two weeks, six weeks, three months. By three months, you're 98% there. Well, I think you bring up a, a, an important question that a lot of patients are going to going to want to ask, and that is, if I need two hip replacements, do you feel it's better to have them both done at one one time, same day, or to stagger them and have one done and then wait till you recover from that, and then maybe three months later have the second one done? What do you advise patients? In general, I advise patients to stagger them. The rare situation where a patient has their hips so physically deformed, where they're bent like a pretzel, where if you fix one, they still can't stand, that would be the indication possibly to do both. But the problem with doing both at the same time is the following. You, don't, you do get a discount, so to say, on the time it takes to heal. Certainly if you do both at the same time by three months, both should be healed. But you don't get a discount on blood loss. You don't get a discount on the stress to a patient's body. And I think that if you do both at the same time with someone who doesn't absolutely need that, you are giving a slight increased risk of complications, medical complications to the patient. And I don't think a surgeon should take that on their shoulders and should discourage patients from increasing their health risk just to save a couple of months of rehab. So I 
feel quite strongly that except if a case has to go and the patient's very healthy, that it's best to stagger them. Well, let's talk a little bit about those complications. And, and you as a surgeon, what are you worried about at the time of the operation going wrong and perhaps the complications that may occur weeks, months, or even years after the procedure? In general, there are a few complications that you worry about early. During the operation, it is possible that the femur could fracture when you put in the femoral stem. So a fracture of the femur is something you are careful to avoid in the operating room. Also in the operating room, you want to avoid hitting any blood vessels or stretching any nerves. And all these have been reported complications. The nerve injuries tend to get better very, very much in the next six to eight weeks. And they don't happen that commonly, but they do happen. And bone fractures, uh, femur fractures, are happening much less commonly with newer designs. Also in the immediate post-op period, you worry about heart attacks, uh, stress to the body with their diabetes. So you look at general medical problems in the early going. The two largest complications we worry about in the short term, but mainly as time goes on, is an infection and dislocation. Infection can happen early, and within the first two or three weeks, it could happen eight months later. An infection can even happen two years later. There are early and late infections we worry about. To prevent them, we do give prophylactic antibiotics, but there's no surgeon I know of in this country who can claim a 0% infection rate. So despite operating in ultra-sterile operating rooms, body exhaust suits, giving the right antibiotics, checking their uh, nose preoperatively to see if they're carriers for staph aureus and doing a variety of techniques, patients can still get infected. Dislocations, though, are getting much more rare with the larger femoral heads. Now, I operate with an anterior type approach and have an extraordinary low dislocation rate. People with a posterior approach may have a larger one, but with the larger heads that have been popular in the last number of years, dislocations are getting much smaller. And those are the major complications. Well, let's talk a little bit about the different types of implants and how you go about choosing an implant for the patient. You know, in the news lately, there's been a, a lot of, of discussion about the metal on metal. And we, for years, we've used metal on plastic. There's also the, the ability to use ceramics now as well. How do you have that discussion with the, with the patient in terms of, one, what implant that you're going to recommend, and two, whether that patient needs to have the implant cemented into place or whether that patient is better off with having that implant press fit without cement into the bone? There are many excellent implants on the market. There are at least five major American companies that produce extraordinarily high quality implants. I think that the device market, with very few glitches, has been an example of an extraordinarily high standard in this country to date. And there's no question there have been some recalls and some problems, but based on the raw numbers, uh, it's a very impressive industry. With that said, there are a lot of surgeons in this country who choose various implant designs. I think mostly they choose them because that's how they trained and based on the type of style and the feel they have of implanting them, that that's the one they continue to use. And you can really take a surgeon and use one or two different companies. There are certain styles of how these get fixed to the bone. So they're not so easily interchangeable. You really have to understand that if a surgeon is used to using implant A, and then all of a sudden is asked to use implant B, it may not be a good idea to force the surgeon to train, uh, sorry, to force the surgeon to change his implant design because he or she have been, has been used to the feel of how that gets fixed and you don't want them to have to go through a learning curve again. But in general, many companies have similar enough devices. I choose almost exclusively an uncemented implant. That means it's a titanium-based implant that gets fixed into the bone through a press fit and the bone grows in quite quickly to the metal. Uh, what, 20 years ago when I first started, we used to use cement, which 
in very good hands, has a very long lifespan, but at this point in time, I believe it's no longer the gold standard. There's a role for cement. There's a role in people who have severe osteoporosis, and there are certain situations to use it. But I feel the gold standard now in hip replacement is a cementless titanium stem with either a metal or a ceramic ball, a titanium shell, and a highly cross-linked polyethylene liner. That construct is probably has the longest follow-up and longest evidence in the literature to support its use. Well, I think that's very good information. Um, as we close this discussion, is there anything that you feel that we have not covered that patients who are faced with a decision of, of whether or not to proceed on with a primary total hip replacement should know? Well, I think, first of all, they should know, despite its remarkable successes, the same care you do with anything important in your life should be taken care of in this situation. One, choose the right surgeon. Choose the right hospital. Understand the operation. Understand what's ahead of you. Make enough arrangements for support after the surgery and be aware of the types of complications that can happen. And when you put that together, you're going to have a much greater chance of having a successful result to the 20, 25, and 35 year longevity, which some of these hip replacements can get to. Well, I think that's excellent advice and I want to thank you for joining us today. I look forward to future discussions about other topics in, in hip replacement and hip disease in general. So thank you very much for joining us today. Once again, thank you, Dr. Seacrest, my pleasure.